Welcome to simulation and prototyping. This is going to be a grasshopper tutorial that explains a couple of different ways to use Kangaroo from a specific application. While this isn't necessarily tied to the simulation and prototyping seminar, it does build on some of those ideas. And I wanted to continue to share some of these advancements. And so what we're going to do this week is we can see an initial condition, which is the kind of ghosted element above. This is just a simple lofted element pinched on two ends and having a shape through the middle. But then what we're going to do is look at do it, adding two types of forces to this, or actually three. One is an internal pressure as a kind of inflation. The second is a gravity load on this inflated object. And the third, as you can see in a second, is the, a floor so that this has a kind of maximum amount that it can stretch. And so we'll be able to change each of those different values. So the, the kind of force, the internal pressure, as well as the resistance of the membrane to that internal pressure. And so we'll be able to make changes to this and produce a number of different things. I'll pause this. The reason why I'm looking at these is we did a research project a few years ago, and we were looking at fabric formed plaster using robotic control. And so what you can see in this image are two robots holding points in space. Between that is a draped piece of fabric filled with plaster. And so once that cured, what we were able to do was to produce or parametrically produce a series of forms. And so what you're seeing here are pieces of them. The, the um, wrinkling at the edge is one edge as that's draped. And so the kind of collection of the fabric, the swelling of the fabric, and the way that that changed or evolved. So let's see. We can see another object here kind of turned. So in terms of the catenary aspect, we can see the element being hung like this, as well as introducing an additional force or a kind of pinch through the middle. And here are a couple of elements where we can see as this would begin to touch down, we can see the difference between the internal pressure and the kind of way that the element was folding. And so it started to produce more like maybe kind of arm and at an elbow. And so what we can do today with this tutorial is we'll be able to change the two points in space and we'll be able to change some of the properties tied to this through the use of Kangaroo. So let's look at how to build this kind of uh, simple system so that we can then prototype a number of different options uh, if you wanted to produce something like this. You probably don't want to produce this exact thing, but I think it could be useful to understand the capability of these two other types of issues of inflating with kangaroo, as well as using the floor as a way to resist forces on that. So let's begin, and I can just start over completely. And what we'll, we can do is then manipulate some of these um, some of these parameters and we can start to see what some of the differences are. So I'm gonna create a new, uh, and let's see, I don't remember what I was using. So I guess my default has been to use inches. So let's see how that works. Maybe the, the values will be off from some of these, but we can look at them. I'll create a new document in Grasshopper. Okay, so the first thing that we wanna do is to begin to understand how to locate these two points in space. And so what I'm gonna do with that is we're going to use the, the points, which are under vectors, and point, and we're gonna build these with just a simple construct point. 
We can see the default is at zero, zero. And we're gonna need two points in space. And because I'm not gonna be, this isn't really a kind of uh, form finding on the, on the front end from the geometry, I don't, I don't need to use sliders. I'm just gonna set these. My shortcut is just forward slash forward slash, which allows us to create a panel. And I'll put a zero in there. And so I do want X and Y to be zero. I'll create another panel and make this 10. So now in the 3D view, we can see we have two points, one at 0, 0, 010. The other one, let's move this over and you can copy your panels or you can add a couple more panels. Um, I'm going to set this to be X at 20 and Y will be zero. These might be, might be um, coordinates that we'll want to change. And Z in this case, I'll set to be 20. And so when we look at this now, we just have two points in space. And if we want, we could add an X, Y plane just to understand where the floor will be because we, we, at the end for representation sake, we wanna have a plane in there so we can see where our object will sag against. And so we can just leave our, our XY plane there set. Next thing we'll do is just create a line between these two points. And that's just gonna be a simple line. So the start point and the end point. So now we know if we move these two points in space, that line will also move. And so what we can do is probably a couple of different ways to do this. And maybe I will, right, we could set a point in the middle and it's easy enough to find that with point on curve. Right, where we get our simple midpoint there. But if we wanted to add additional shapes rather than just a shape at the two ends and in the middle, we could divide our curve. And so let's do that. Let's divide curve. And so our curve will be our line. Our count will be, let's say zero is less than five. And so if we divide by two, we can see we get three points because of it's counting zero. And so if we said three or four, why don't I use four? Because that way you could always change your loft to produce more complexity. And then I'll show you a kind of simple trick for using uh, these multiple um, elements that come out of a list. So our points, we're gonna have five points there. Let's do a list item now. And so this will allow us to work with these points independently to put a circle at those points and then feed those into the loft. And so in this case, I usually don't like the wrap, but I'm gonna leave the wrap on for now. Let's set the index to zero. Do that simply with a panel. And what results, we can actually hide a few of these other things. Why don't we hide our points that we started with? We could, I can keep our line on, but I'll hide the divide curve. So now we see index at um, the first point. If we zoom in to the index, we can add a couple of things here. Because we have the wrap on and I do minus one, it goes back and it wraps, and this gives us the other point. We can see I is zero. And I think if we can just change this to be, oh, it doesn't actually allow us to do that, but let's set this to be plus three. So now we can pull the midpoint, the first point, and the last point from this list. 
And so that's an easy way to do it. What I want to do now is just put a simple circle at those points. And so let's do that with the base plane. And actually, we're going to do it with the center, the normal, and the radius. Because what's nice about this is we'll do this and this will give us the two circles. The normal we already have, which is our line. And then we can set a radius. And maybe we'll set, let's see what the radius is. We'll say zero is less than five. We can turn this into a real as opposed to an integer. And then we can really vary these. At the end, we want these to be relatively small compared to at the middle. And so what I'm going to do is just copy this Actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to copy this twice because I want to have the first one be I, the third one to be I minus one, and the middle one to be oh, I plus two. And then we don't necessarily need, doesn't let us get rid of, we can only add or delete, we can't delete the one in the middle, but we have that, the one in the middle, we'll set this radius to be larger. So make sure this is working for you. What we want is our line at the two ends. And as I click on these, we can see here's our first, circle, here's our middle circle, and here's our last circle. And so again, the, the list is a little out of order because I use the shortcut to use the minus one to find the last one. I is zero, which is our first one, and then plus two is our middle. And so basically we wanna create a kind of banana shape that goes from thin to thick to thin. We can always reverse these later and see what that looks like. And I'm keeping our line, the preview on for our line so that we can use that as, a, as an initial condition when we get to kangaroo. So now we have our three circles. Let's merge these three circles into one in this order. And we can flatten these down and put them into a loft. So there we have our simple cigar shape or, or banana kind of shape for our loft. We can hide our circles and you can play with your, with your sliders. We can see as that becomes zero, it becomes nothing and then that creates a problem. So we just want the first and last position to be very small. And then we'll just look at the proportions as we play with this later, as we get to kangaroo, well, how wide this should be in the middle. For now, we can see that our loft is working. And so that's, that's all we really need for the static grasshopper geometry. Everything that we do from here on out is going to be related to kangaroo. And so we could even group all of this together. We wanna keep these things pretty clear. That's gonna be grasshopper geometry. The next thing that we have to do is to convert our, our B rep into a mesh so that we can use this for kangaroo. So what I'd like to do for that is to do the mesh, the mesh surface. And this just allows us to control the U and the V. And so our surface will be our loft. We can now hide that. And let's look at 
um, the U and the V related to this. So let's say these were some of the numbers that I used before. For U, I had 75. And for V, I had 20. And let's look at, as we do this, we can deconstruct our mesh. And now we can get a better sense for how these play out. So if we turn this down to 10, that is in fact the, the V is the short direction, 75. Turn this down. We can see that's the long direction. So depending on what resolution we're working at, this will be the place where we can where we can come back and set these. And we don't have to worry about anything else there. So let's now, what we wanna be able to do is to get our vertices from that mesh. And we wanna be able to get them in the short direction through here. And so we know that our V count is 10. And let's see what happens. I want to uh, break my lists into chunks. And so we're gonna do that with partition list. And let's see how that works. So we're gonna take our vertices, plug them in. And now let's, I also like to kind of expose some of the things that I'm working with. So the thought here is that I wanna tie this in and I'm gonna use an expression. The expression is just going to be simply using one variable, which is going to be our V count. I'm just going to add one. So this will just be X plus one. There are other kind of simpler ways to do it, but what I like is to have this visible so that when I come back to the file, um, Way too many times I've come back and I've embedded something by right clicking and adding an integer and I can't find those things. And so what we're doing now is simply saying that our V count, the reason why we're adding one is that because it starts at zero, we'll see the way that this, that this plays out in a second. So let's add a list or a panel, sorry. So that we, we'll add a panel so that we can look at our list And now we can see that even though we have 10 in the V count, we have to add, add one because when we say 10 over here, that actually means 11, zero to 10. And so now we have a list that's been partitioned based on those. So let's see if this is doing what we want it to do. So we'll do another list item. Because what we want to, what we're trying to do now is to get, is to capture the points at the end and the points at the end so that we can fix those for the simulation. And so typically what will happen here is that if I set this to be, okay. So we can see by clicking on the list item, it's defaulting to things running, the, the vertices running in the long direction. There's an easy fix to that, which is called flip matrix, which is the way that I imagine this is just, if it's something is in an Excel spreadsheet, we can flip it from being columns to rows or rows to columns. And so that's what flip matrix does. And so when we do this, we click it, now we're seeing all of these 11 points at the end. So let's do this once more. 
Actually, we can just copy our list item and we should be able to do, now we'll pull our minus one. And actually we don't even need to copy it. We can pull those out independently from here. So we see our first one and our last one. So that works well. So that now, those couple of steps, we can also group together. And those are the setup for kangaroo in terms of the geometry, in terms of creating a mesh. We can turn off all of the other vertices. We have those endpoints and that's fine. So now let's build what we need for kangaroo. So we'll go up to kangaroo two. We're going to use our bouncy solver. We're going to show, we'll use show. We're gonna to wanna to merge here as well, to merge all of the different elements together. And in terms of the bouncy solver, we just need a couple of things. Let's do a Boolean toggle. Turn it on or off. Let's use, and I believe, hopefully this is still true. I can get, a, get this to work with a small number of iterations. So I had this set to two. I can always increase this. And let's put a button here so that we can restart it. The goal objects are going to be that come from our merge, and we can flatten that down as well. Okay, so let's look at a couple of elements. The first thing that we will do is we want to show our mesh. And so we'll come all the way back to our mesh. Plug that into the show and plug that into the merge. We can move these so that we can differentiate them. So from that, let's do a couple of other things. Let's get our, uh, let's set an anchor. And so that will be under goals related to point. We'll grab the anchor. And what we'll do with this is we're going to create a point container. <coughs> and let's pull our points from both of these in. So we click on it, we can see the endpoints here and the endpoints here. We want to connect this into the point target. And then let's set the strength to be 1,000. And this will be one of the parameters that we can always change later. We'll plug this into our merge. Oh, plug this into the second spot on our merge. And now let's add our internal pressure as well. And this is a pretty simple element with under goals and mesh for pressure. And so the input for this is going to be our mesh and then our strength. So let's come back to our mesh, plug this in. The strength here, we'll try a few different things, but mine was working with 300. So we'll start there and we'll, we'll vary to see how that goes. The next thing that I want to do is to um, constrain or basically set the, the strength or the stretchiness of the mesh itself. And so this is under the mesh goals and under uh, edge lengths. And the same thing, we'll plug the mesh into that. And the length factor is going to be how much we allow it to change. So 
we'll start with 1.1 and the strength I'm going to set to 900. We'll plug this into our merge. And the last thing that I want to do is, well, there's two more. Let's set the uh, a sense of gravity. And so something that's pulling this down. We'll do this with the, let's see, with vertex loads. And so with vertex loads, we'll again easily just set the mesh. And let's set the strength to be, this will be minus because we want it pulling down. And let's say minus 10. Oh. Plug that into the merge. And then the last thing we'll do is set the floor. And so this is under goals related to point, and we'll set the floor. And so the strength of the floor, I have set to a very high number, 10,000. Because I did not want this to, to ooze through the floor or fall through the floor. Okay, so those should be the main elements that we have for that. From the output, let's just set geometry to that. And then while we're here, we can just do a custom render. And so we can see this is already coming out. I, we should hide a number of things here. And those should be all set. We don't need those points. And our floor should be at the XY plane. So we'll check that in a second. So now what you should do is you can, should toggle the Boolean toggle. Let's turn this on and see what happens. So we can see it both inflating and falling. As it hits the floor, we can see it being restrained by the floor and we can see that changing. And so it may, may converge if you let it run, but we can also set that to be false if we want to check some, some things that are going on. And we can also look at varying some of these, these things. The internal pressure and the mesh length will have a relationship to one another. The target is basically just restraining these two ends. As long as it's being held in place, that's okay. And so really what we can look at is the internal pressure and the, the gravity that's pulling it down. So if we want to change slightly, we could go from minus 10 to minus eight. I would recommend only changing one value at a time we can reset, so it'll start. They'll start over, but changing if you change multiple values, there's going to be interaction between those, and so change one value, reset it, see what happens, so you can get a better handle on these things. So with a little less gravity, we can see we get more of a, a uniform element between them. We can pause it and reset it. We could also change this to minus 15. And so in this case, what we should get is a couple of those kind of like elbow conditions because the gravity, so we can see that here and here, the gravity 
is greater than the internal pressure. And so we start to see that occurring here. Because of the length, we can also see that it's coming down and it's moving to the side because this length is getting longer. And so what I'm gonna do is change this back to minus 10. Reset it. And then we can see what happens if we change the length factor. And we can also change the pressure. So once you start with this, having a just between these three parameters, we can really produce a range of options. These are tied to the, um, the fabric form plaster that we were working with. But it was amazing to me when I started working with this, the ability to begin to simulate some of what was happening. So then we're back to minus 10. But let's even allow, what if we go to 1.5 and reset. Huh, it just exploded. And so what happens here is that we allowed the length to increase so much, and this is also tied to the strength, that if we turn this down, let's say to 0.7, and we reset, that's really giving you the, that's tied to the dimension of these. And so in this case, it's not even touching the floor because we didn't allow it to sag enough. And so it's really increasing that strength. We could also, between these two, probably reduce the strength and reset. And so the, the strength of the resistance at that point is less. And so you can see this is less an issue of putting in specific values related to specific strength, but it is a balance between looking at um, what results from it. And they're, they're related. So if we, if we reduce the strength, the internal pressure in relationship to those things will seem to increase. So, so here it is falling enough. It is hitting the floor. Maybe we could I'll leave that at 10. It'll change this to 0.8. Reset it. And then I just want to play with the internal pressure as well. We'll do two last things to kind of finalize the, the visualization and representation. One is I just want to draw a plane for the floor. That's looking okay. Let's just, we can reduce our pressure, go to 200 and reset. And you should have a sense that it won't swell as much. I'll warn you that when I was increasing the internal pressure earlier, it kept exploding and exploding and exploding. And so let's increase this to 350 and see what happens. In this case, we don't necessarily need to reset. I think it will keep swelling and there it goes. So it's beyond its limits for that. So let's try 325. In this case, we can reset.
Gonna watch it fall and stretch. And this might be just the difference between it looks like it's going to explode. We can always stop it and capture it at one point, but it's like filling that sleeve with too much plaster, right? And where we start to see it bulge and where we start to see it change. But it looks like even 325 is going to be too much. Set that back to 300. And so what I wanted to do was two, two more things. One, in Rhino, I'll set just a simple planar surface. And that's defaulting to zero or defaulting to the XY plane. And so in Grasshopper, we can hide our XY plane. We can, we're just in wireframe, so we can go to a shaded view or a ghosted view. And then the other thing that I would like to do is to just um, deal with the representation of the mesh. And let's set, uh, we'll pick a swatch, color swatch, and choose choose a color that makes sense, maybe just in terms of contrast to whatever your background is and contrast to whatever your plane is. And then I'm gonna copy both of these and pull them over, maybe not to the mesh, but to the lofted surface. So I can hide our mesh, plug in our lofted surface, and then I just want it ghosted there. So I'm gonna use the alpha channel and just make this a ghosted element. And we can also, we had our line previewed. We can turn that off. The loft will give us a line where the seam is. Maybe this is an argument to use our mesh. Okay, so if you use the mesh, you won't get the seam of the loft. And remember, we can go all the way back and you can see with the alpha channel, this is transparent, at least through the rhino geometry, sorry, through the grasshopper geometry, not the rhino geometry. But we can go all the way back to the beginning and we can move these points. So what happens if we want to raise the Z, point, the Z coordinate of our lowest side? We can raise that to 15. And so that's that relationship of the two endpoints. We can move them left, right, up, down, whatever we want to do. But now we also have a representation of the starting condition. We have a representation of the floor. And then all we have to do is come back to uh, engage the bouncy solver. And let it drop to the floor. You can play with the parameters. And so because we raised this point up, now we're just getting to the point that's actually not even touching the floor yet. And so we could change that with either the, the gravity. Oh, I think the inflation is too much. Or the mesh factors is not strong enough. So let's turn this back up, maybe 800. We'll reset it. And we may have to, because we lifted this up higher, we may have to increase the uh, negative load, essentially the gravity on the object, if we wanted to touch the, the ground. In this case, what we're getting is a nice kind of catenary element with internal pressure on that membrane. So let's set, let's go minus 15. We can reset it. We could also move those two points down 
closer to the floor too. And so this is, it is really an iterative form finding exercise. Just, oh, not even touching the floor now. And so the amount of sag is really has to do with the length factor. And now we can see it's it's not only hitting the floor, but it's also uh, extended its length so much that it even begins to slide off to the side. But now you have a representation of the floor. You have a representation of the starting geometry, and you have a representation of the element that's that has both the internal pressure and a gravity load on it. So now you can you can bake any of these things. So we could come here, we could bake this geometry. And so if we wanted to look at at a number of different options, what's happening? Ah, I see. So what we would really want to do, let's see what happens if we just pull a mesh out of this. So what do we have in terms of rhino geometry? I think what, what we got were the vertices. This is probably from line to mesh. And so we can start to look at how we begin to convert some of those things. Let's see. What I would want to do is to extract. All right, so there is a mesh. There are lines. And so what we could do is clean tree, remove the nulls. So once we clean the tree, what we end up with is a mesh and all of the lines. And so what we should be able to get, let's go back here. Let's bake it and then we can just group it together. This will give us both the mesh and the lines. So as we start to make modifications, we can have a static representation of the geometry off to the side as these things vary. So for instance, let's look at increasing the length or the strength of the gravity. more. So what we should get is more vertical load between these and a slightly different shape. And stop this. Make and group this one. Now we can start to build a family of these or a population of these off to the side so we can see their similarities and differences. And so a nice form finding way if you're working on something similar. So I hope this helps. I hope this, well, I hope this hope helps in general. I hope that it helps with your understanding of building your knowledge of kangaroo in terms of what we're putting together, how we constrain these, and how we start to change them. 
So let me know if you have any questions. I hope you enjoy this and I look forward to seeing what you're modeling. Also consider subscribing to the YouTube channel and giving this a like. As you know, the algorithms love those things. All right, thank you.